I don't know if you've heard, but he has risen. He, is risen uh, he certainly has risen, and the church can say he has risen indeed. Uh, I want to encourage you to open your Bibles to Luke chapter 24. Uh, this morning, we're, we're continuing a two-part series that we began last week where we're looking at these titles that have been given to Jesus, that he is both lion and lamb. Last week, we considered what's traditionally referred to as the uh, Palm Sunday or, or the triumphal entry of Jesus as he makes his way into Jerusalem. He does so on what's uh, referred to as Lamb Selection Day in preparation for Passover, and what historically had been Lamb Selection Day, Jesus, uh, according to the plan and in fulfillment of Scripture, journeys into Jerusalem as if God has selected his lamb and places him before humanity to be evaluated and considered in the days that would precede his crucifixion on the cross, the day of Passover. And as he's been examined by humanity, he gets before Pontius Pilate, and Pontius Pilate appropriately notes in his human judgment that here is a man without guilt. And Peter would say that he is a lamb without blemish. The authors of Hebrews would speak of the sacrifice of this lamb, that it's a once and for all sacrifice. And John the Baptist, in seeing Jesus come from afar, would say, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And this last week, as we've journeyed towards this Easter Sunday, this Resurrection Sunday, we have done so in light of a lamb that has been provided for us so that we can see death pass over us, much like for the first Passover, those who were under the hands of the Egyptians. That through the blood of the lamb that we can escape death and we can echo the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Death wears your victory, oh death wears your sting for the sting of death which is sin has been left in Jesus. And what gives sin its power, the law has been fulfilled by Christ. All of its legal demands over your life and mine. And so this week we've celebrated the fact that a lamb has been provided. And that through the blood of the lamb there's forgiveness and life that can be found. But this is not the only title that is given to Jesus. He's not not just the lamb, he's also the lion. And on Easter Sunday, it, it's hard to mis miss and, and mistake the, the powerful claim of the lion. And so in Luke chapter 24, just two uh, pretty robust thoughts that I want to leave for you on, on this Resurrection Sunday in, in light of just this one main idea that I hope resonates in your hearts and your minds today. The lion of Judah is alive Amen. and he is coming again. I would encourage you to follow along Luke chapter 24. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices that they had prepared, and they found that the stone had been rolled away from the tomb. And when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. Uh, while they were perplexed about this, two men stood beside them in dazzling apparel, and as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, and the men said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. Remember how he had told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered in the hands of sinful men, that he must be crucified, and that on the third day he would rise. And they remembered his words, and they returned from the tomb, and they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them as an idle tale, and they did not believe them. Peter rose and he ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen clothes by themselves and he went home marveling at what had happened. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. And while they were talking and the disciples uh, and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near to them and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and beside all this, it is now the third day since these things had happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us that they were at the tomb early this morning. And when they did not find the body, they came back saying that they had seen a vision of angels 
who said that he, Jesus, was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb, found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he, Jesus, says to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken, was it not necessary that Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And behold, with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going further, but they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is towards evening and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them and he was at the table with them and he took bread, blessed and broke it and gave it to them and their eyes were opened. They recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven, and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and has appeared to Simon. And then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. Just, just two thoughts I, I want to leave with you on, on this Sunday. Uh, first is the resurrection of Jesus is historical. I think it's appropriate for us to consider the historicity of Christ's resurrection on a Sunday like this because of what this text says. For many over the ages, this has seemed like an idle tale. This has seemed like something that's fanciful, something that's been embellished, a legend that's been made up. Even on that very first Resurrection Sunday, there were those who were in Jesus' presence, and they they say to to those who had spoken of the empty tomb, this is just an idle tale. I don't don't believe it. And this this has been a a common approach to the resurrection of Christ, And, and yet Luke takes his gospel, and if you know the gospel of Luke, in chapter 1, he writes these things so that we might have a historical account regarding the life, the ministry, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. This is why Luke took up the effort of writing this gospel, and and in his gospel, he communicates clear details that give insight into the historicity of Christ's life. And so in chapter 24, verse 1, he says, on the first day of the week, At early dawn, they went into the tomb. Why are they going into the tomb? Well, it's been well attested to historically that Christ died a death by crucifixion. The crucifixion of Jesus is referred to by more than 10 ancient sources. Tacitus, Josephus, Marbar, Serapion, Lucian, the Talmud, the Clement of Rome, Ignatius, Polycarp, Barnabas, Justin Martyr, all speak of of Jesus dying a a death by crucifixion. And, And all of these sources are remarkably early, especially when compared to other sources that speak of other ancient historical figures. An example might be Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great is known as one of the greatest leaders and one of the greatest military minds in the ancient world. And the earliest sources for Alexander's life that record the events of his life are 300 years after his life. And the best sources that record his life are 400 years after his life, and yet they're still considered trustworthy sources. With Jesus, we have not only the biblical text, but we have extra biblical text, and and some of it dates back within 10 years of of his uh, ascension into heaven, and some within 70 years, speaking of the fact that Jesus has died a death by crucifixion. Antiquities 18 verse 63 says, at this time there was a wise man called Jesus and his conduct was good and he was known to be virtuous. Many people among the Jews and other nations became his disciples and Pilate condemned him to be crucified and to die. Why is is it important to note the historical evidences that support a crucifixion of Christ? Because someone can't defeat death until they first died. And we're not talking about an idle tale. We're not talking about a legend that's been embellished over the ages, but we're talking about a man who was crucified, according to many historical texts, including the biblical text, and and his death was defeated through his resurrection. It's not just that he died a death by crucifixion, but we read here that, that the disciples experienced what they believed were evidences of the resurrected Christ. The disciples' experience with the risen Savior, they're reported in all of the Gospels, they're reported in, in the New Testament epistles, also reported by a number of other ancient historians that would say that the disciples really believed. They really believed that they had encountered the resurrected Christ. Josephus, Ignatius, Justin Martyr. 
And Bart Ehrman, one of the uh, modern voices that critiques Christianity and the reliability of Scripture, he says this. He says, what is certain is that the earliest followers of Jesus believed that Jesus had come back to life in the body and that this was a body that had real bodily characteristics. It could be seen, it could be touched, it had a voice that could be heard. It's not just the disciples believed this. You would expect the disciples who had vested interest in the ministry of Jesus would speak of of the the resurrection of Christ. But but it's not just those who follow Jesus that speak of the the resurrection. We, We not only have enemy attestation, we have an enemy who converts to Christianity. Paul believed that he had seen the resurrected Christ. Now, enemy attestation is a a powerful form of testament because what it does is it takes someone who you would expect not to affirm a particular position, and they're the voice that's affirming the particular position. Now, we go one step further with Paul. It's not just that he attests to the resurrection of Christ, but he converts to Christianity. We see James, the half-brother of Jesus, turn from a skeptic to a believer, so much so that we see a a recording of a convening of judges in uh, the Antiquities 20, verse 200, where we see a a leader trying to bring James before the Sanhedrin because of his his claim that Jesus has risen from the dead. Here's, here's, Here's the truth on this Resurrection Sunday. The tomb is empty. The tomb's empty. And, and it's been recorded to by historians that Jesus' body no longer lays in the tomb. And so you have many who've tried to provide some sort of natural explanation to the emptiness of the tomb. You have some who say, well, the disciples stole the body. And we know that the disciples not only believed in the resurrection of Christ, but they were willing to give their life for the resurrection of Christ. You have some that say, well, Jesus passed out on the cross, but probably didn't die. So three days later, he woke up, passed out, right, dry blood, Bruises, makes his way to the disciples, demonstrates his resurrection power. Well, that, you don't understand the, the Roman means of crucifixion. You say, well, well, maybe, maybe it is that Jesus just appeared as a, as a ghost. Now, this, doesn't, this doesn't give an account for the masses that would convert to Christianity. No historian that's reliable would deny that thousands of people began to follow the life and the teaching of Jesus in the first century shortly after the alleged resurrection. And that this number continued to grow rapidly throughout the remainder of the first century. And there are a ton of biblical and extra-biblical texts that support this emergence of the early church. And to be clear, the emergence of the early church centered on the claim that Jesus had risen from the dead. In Acts, that the pangs of death could not hold him. In Revelation 1, that he holds the keys of life and death, this resurrected Savior. It's not just that the resurrection is historical, but that the resurrection is biblical. We see in this text that Jesus, walking with these men on the road to Emmaus, he says, you foolish ones, slow of heart to believe all that the prophets had spoken to you. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And so he begins with Moses and the prophets Summary, he's beginning with the Old Testament, and he begins to interpret for these men the, the right interpretation of the Scriptures and the ways that they speak of himself. How was it that Jesus would use the Old Testament to reveal himself as the anticipated Messiah? This is probably the best sermon that's ever been given on this earth, and it's not recorded. I'm thankful my sermons don't get compared to this sermon that's not recorded. But Jesus has taken the scriptures and, and, and he's, he's, he's helping us understand that he's the fulfillment of the scriptures. That everything in the Old Testament is pointing forward to this Christ who would fulfill the law and the prophets. And so I, I've oftentimes wondered how is it that Jesus takes this Old Testament text and sees himself as the fulfillment? Is it through the covenants that it would be through the seed of the woman and, and the offspring of Abraham and from the line of David and the one who would observe? Absorb the wrath of God so that the wrath of God wouldn't be experienced like it was in the days of Noah? Or is it through the, 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 the symbols of, of the Old Testament and the ways that the animals would be brought to sacrifice? Or is it through the celebrations and the festivals of the Old Testament that John, the Gospel of John, seems to speak to? Or, or is it all of these things? And, and I just wish I could have sat at the feet of Jesus and heard him speak about these things. Probably a lot of these things. And yet Jesus speaks to the fact that that these men had missed it. 
And there's a strong and there's a sober warning for us now 2,000 years later that if those who walked with Jesus and had the scriptures that pointed to Jesus missed it, that there's a, there's a chance. I mean, if we're being honest with ourselves, there's a chance that you and I could, could also miss it. Why is it, why is it and how is it that, that a person can miss it? And, and the scriptures plainly speaking as Jesus would interpret them concerning himself? Well, I, I think there's a lot of reasons why we miss it. Um, one reason that I'll just propose to you is that we tend to, to see the text linear. And God, God seems to interact with the text a bit differently than we do. When, when we look from a distance and, and we see the linear text, we don't see the breaks in the fulfillment of the prophecies that God had given. And so we, we read texts like Isaiah 61, and we see it as one text. But Jesus even seems to allude to the reality that there's a gap in the fulfillment of the prophecies in his life. Luke chapter 4, 17 verse 21, we see the the scroll of the prophet Isaiah is handed to Jesus. He unrolls the scroll. He finds his place where it is written. Here's what Jesus reads from Isaiah chapter 62. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recover sight for the blind and to set the oppressed free to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolls up the scroll, gives it back to the attendant, and he sits down. And the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And Jesus begins to say to them, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Now, if you know Isaiah 62, it's an odd thing that Jesus would turn there and, and stop where he stops. Isaiah 62, the prophecy actually continues, and Jesus stops mid-sentence as if there's a prophetic break, that his first coming is going to look profoundly different than his second coming. The direct quote that comes from Isaiah 62, verse 2, in which Jesus stops mid-sentence, the second part of this sentence says this, not only does, does the one who's anointed by the Lord proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, but also proclaims the day of the vengeance of our God. Jesus stops mid-sentence. As if there's a prophetic break and we're looking from a distance, thinking linear, and we see the first part of the sentence and we just assume the second part of the sentence goes hand in hand. And and they they miss the fact that the first coming of Christ is going to look profoundly different than the second coming of Christ. Why is it that Jesus stops midway through Isaiah? Might I suggest this, that in his first coming, it looks profoundly different than his second coming? His first coming, he comes in riding on a donkey. The second coming, he comes riding in on a war horse. First coming, he wears a crown of thorns. The second coming, he holds an iron scepter. The the first coming, he's the suffering servant regarded in Isaiah 53. The second coming, he's the king of kings and he's the Lord of lords according to Zechariah 14 and Revelation 19. The first coming, he carries the cross. The second coming, he bears the crown. The first coming, as we were reminded of this week, he was the lamb that was slain. The second coming, he is the lion that establishes the throne of David. And the Lion of Judah. And the Lion of, of Judah is, is a prophecy that's given all the way back in Genesis 49. It's, the text is, is actually profoundly interesting in light of this idea that God provides near fulfillments and far fulfillments to his prophecies that have been given to his people. And the meaning behind Jesus being called of, of the Lion, the Lion of, of Judah, is spoken of in, in Genesis 49, in, in which Jacob, also known as Israel, is, is speaking prophecy of blessing and curse over his children. And in Genesis 49, verses 8 through 10, we see the prophecy that's given to Judah, which begins this idea that shows up in Scripture and history as Judah being represented as a lion. Genesis 49, 8 through 10, Judah, your brothers shall praise you. Your hands shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's son shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's club, and from the prey, my son, you have gone up. He has stooped down, and he has crouched as a lion and as a lioness. Who would dare to rouse him? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until the tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of 
the people. Now, the context of Genesis 49, why it is that the blessing and the curse is, is falling to, to Jacob's children who would be the representative of the 12 tribes of Israel, the context is there's a famine in Egypt. Uh, uh, Jacob sends his sons to, to go receive help from the man who's distributing the food, who happens to be Joseph, one of his sons, who had been sold into slavery. If you're familiar with the story, uh, the brothers turn on Joseph, send him into slavery. Joseph's turn uh, back uh, has the back of his brothers turned on him. The, the master, um, his wife uh, slanders him. The master's back turns on him. He goes to prison. The, the, the prisoner that's with him in jail turns his back on him. And yet God providentially works in his life, elevating him into the second position in all of Egypt, distributing the food for this famine. And so, so Jacob, Israel, sends his children to go get help from Egypt because a famine hit the land. And so as they, as they go before Joseph, they don't recognize him as Joseph. They ask for help, and, and the story unfolds. Joseph is trying to weigh out their motives. He has, he has reason to question their character. He seems to be a bit shrewd in the text, trying to discern whether or not they're trying to manipulate him. And, and so through the course of, of this conversation, Genesis 48, we see that they go back to Jacob, and, and we see the request that Benjamin join the brothers before Joseph. And, and Jacob's like, I've, I've already lost Joseph. I got a son that's now in, in Pharaoh's court being held captive, and you want Benjamin to go with you? I think not. And this is where Judah steps up, and Judah, before his father, says, Israel, send the boy with me, and we will rise and go that we may live and not die, both we and you and also our little ones. I will, uh, I will be a pledge of safety for him, and from my hand you shall require him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame. And so in Judah's preparation of bringing his brother before Joseph, we see Judah's promise to protect his brother. Fast forward, now Benjamin's before Joseph in chapter 44 of Genesis. Now, therefore, because Joseph's, Joseph's asking Benjamin to stay, uh, Judah says, Now, therefore, please let your servant, myself, remain instead of the boy and let the boy go back with his brother. So Judah's not only willing to promise his protection of his brother, but Judah is willing to take the place of his brother. And this precedes this prophecy over Judah and the line from which Jesus would come in Genesis chapter 49. And so just a couple thoughts about the line of Judah. The first is, according to this prophecy in, in, in Genesis 49, the lion is to be praised so that the scriptures might be fulfilled. Your brothers shall praise you, tribute should come to you, and to him shall be the obedience to all people. What do we find in Jesus, the Lion of Judah? Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11 says, Therefore God exalted Jesus to the highest place and gave him the name that's above every name, that in the name of Jesus every knee would bow and every tongue would confess that Jesus Christ is Lord in heaven and on earth to the glory of God the Father. That, that for generations past, God had made this promise in Scripture and now is fulfilling it through the Lion of Judah who has come who's worthy to be praised. Second thought, the line of Judah is the victor so that the scriptures might be fulfilled. The text in, in, in Genesis 49 says, your hands shall be on the neck of your enemies. Who would dare rouse you as the lion? And 1 Corinthians 15, 24 through 26 says, the end will come. And when we're handed over to the kingdom of God, the Father, after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death, for he has put everything under his feet. That the Lion of Judah is the greatest victor. He has defeated your greatest foe, and there is nothing that you face today that is greater than the great diplomat that Billy Graham says, which is death, and death has been defeated by the lion who is the victor. The lion is also the king that scriptures might be fulfilled. We see in, in this prophecy in Genesis 49 that the scepter will not depart from Judah. We see this echoed in 1 Chronicles 17, 11 through 14 to David, who is from the tribe of Judah. And to David it says, When your days are fulfilled to walk with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, one of your own sons, and I will establish his kingdom, and he will build a house for me, and I will establish his throne forever, and I will be to him a father, 
He shall be to me a son, and I will take my steadfast love from him as I took it from, uh, uh, as I took it from him who is before you. But I will confirm him in my house and in my kingdom forever, and his throne shall be established forever. You wonder why it is that the genealogy in, in Matthew and the genealogy in Luke chapter 3 take us all the way back to David and all the way back to Abraham because it's a fulfillment of the covenant of scriptures. And Jesus here begins with Moses and the prophets and he interprets them in, the, in front of these men concerning himself. We see that Jesus is the lion who is the great victor. Jesus is the lion to be praised and Jesus is the lion who is the king and who establishes a kingdom. This is what's described in Daniel chapter 2 before the Babylonian king, that the king of Babylon would fall, and following the king of Babylon would come the king of Persia and the Medes, and he too would fall, and following the Medes and the Persians would come the king of the Greeks, and he too would fall, and following the king of the Greeks would be the king and, and the emperors of, of Rome, and they too would fall, and, and, and they would fall by the rock who would come. Daniel 2, 44, in the days of those kings, the God of heaven, he will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It will break into pieces all the kingdoms that have preceded them and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. Jesus, the lion, is also king. Here's just a, a bonus thought, not necessarily tied to the prophecy in, in Genesis. The bonus thought for you is this, the, the lion is coming again so that the scriptures might be fulfilled. The lion has come to fulfill the scriptures, and the lion will come again so that we might see the scriptures fulfilled. Revelation chapter 5, 5. I don't have time to fully unpack the context, but uh, the, the, the story is the scroll gets brought before the people. It can't be opened, and so John begins to weep. Revelation 5, 5 says, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah. The root of David, he has conquered so that uh, the scroll can be opened and its seven seals. And we fast forward in Revelation. We look at Revelation 19, 11 through 16. And then I saw heaven open and behold, a white horse and the one sitting on it was called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he judges and he makes war. And his eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a uh, name written that no one knows but himself, and he has clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. This takes us back to John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. Verse 14 of chapter 1, that Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. What did he do as he dwelled among us? He lived the life that you and I couldn't live. He paid the debt that you and I deserved so that through faith in him we might live a life that's undeserved. And he's coming again, same name, the Word of God. Verse 14 of chapter 19, the armies... The armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on a white horse, and from his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. Takes us all the way back to Genesis. And he will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God, the Almighty, and on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The resurrection is historical. The resurrection is biblical. The final word for you, the resurrection is to be profoundly personal. These men who met Jesus on the road to Emmaus, the ones who came to the tomb finding it empty, their eyes are open. They recognize Jesus and they speak of a heart that burns while God is incarnate is with them, Jesus, and that he opens scriptures to them. And so they return to Jerusalem and they make claim that Jesus is alive. One of my, one of my favorite quotes is not by a theologian, uh, but rather by a friend. And if you've been with our church for a while, you, you know that this is my favorite quote. And this speaks of the personal nature of the resurrection my friend said this, he said that those who knew me before I met Christ would not recognize the person that I am today. And the people that know me today would not recognize the person that I was before I met Christ. The truth is, is that Jesus is alive and that he is coming again. And this should give us great hope. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful uh, for your word. And we're thankful for the life uh, that you lived, uh, the debt that you paid uh, so that we I might find eternal life through faith in your son, Jesus. We're thankful that he 
is a lion who is worthy to be praised. We're thankful that he has established a kingdom and a, a throne, it occupies a throne that will have no end. We're thankful for the victory that has been displayed. And Lord, if we're being honest, if it's true that you could defeat death, then there is nothing that we face in this life that we need to fear. And so we pray this Resurrection Sunday that we would fix our eyes on Jesus, the one who is risen from the dead. Because even the power of death could not hold him. And now Jesus, seated at your right hand, intercedes on our behalf, and he holds what Scripture says are the keys to life and death. And your word's so profoundly clear that if we believe that Jesus is Lord, and if we believe that you, God, have raised Jesus from the dead, then there is salvation to be found through faith in him. So, Lord, I pray for anyone here this morning that has not found this eternal life, that has not found forgiveness, that has not found this living hope because they do not know the living Savior. Lord, I pray today would be the day that you open their eyes they'd be able to leave this place and speak of the resurrection of Christ. That they would be able to say with confidence that the sin and the shortcoming and the failure of their life, that debt, while significant, has been paid in full through the lamb that was provided. And that the victory was won through the lion who was risen from the dead. We love you, Lord. We thank you. We ask these things in your son Jesus' name.